Miami Hurricane spring practice is less than three weeks away. So is the next offensive coordinator going to have enough time to install an offense, some kind of an offense, by March 4th? You are Locked on Canes, your daily podcast on the Miami Hurricane. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. I am Alex Dono, your host. Happy Monday. Congrats to the Kansas City Chiefs. Dion Bush of the Kansas City Chiefs. And thank you so much for making Locked on Canes your first listen today. We are available free wherever you get your podcasts and available free on YouTube. This episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. With LinkedIn Jobs, you can hire qualified candidates more efficiently by matching open roles with people who have the skills, values, and experiences to help you achieve your 2023 goals. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Terms and conditions apply. We have a special guest with us. You know him. You love him. He's provided some of the best Miami Hurricanes highlights in recent years. The touchdown to Daryl Langham. Malik Rozier, former Miami Hurricanes quarterback, is with us. Malik, how are you doing, sir? How you been? I'm doing great. How about you, Donna? Doing so well, man. It's so so great to see your face again and to chat with you again. Malik and I uh, did all the uh, Hurricanes post-game shows from last season, which means we uh, had a lot of not-so-fun post-game shows with the way that last year went. But, you know, so so the big uh, topic, Malik, for the last several weeks has been offensive coordinator. Um, so first things first, you're a former Miami Hurricanes quarterback. You've seen coaching changes happen around you before. When it comes to getting a new offense installed, what goes into that and like what needs to happen? If a new coordinator is hired within the next couple of days, uh, how much can be installed by the time spring practice starts on March 4th? To me, the biggest thing with the spring, and uh, it was one thing that Rick did a really good job of when he came in, is kind of setting like your core plays. Okay, so everyone should have core runs, core passes. Um, to me, that's really what you want to set in the spring because a lot of times most people, like most offensive linemen, like I know um, when Georgia had Pittman and it's something they do at Arkansas lab, like Pittman, his his go-to run is inside zone. So if that is your OC's go-to run and maybe that's even, you know, Mario's go-to run, then like the first week of install should be nothing but inside zone, maybe some quick game. Um, keep it real simple. Um, and I know like I've been a big admin for it, you know, play fast. Like my biggest thing is I'd rather guys play fast, play with energy and the playbook stay simple. And then you go from spring to summer and then you add another layer and then you go from summer to fall and then you add your third layer. Um, but to me, I think it's someone that is smart enough to know that, you know, I can't implement my entire offense this spring. Cause obviously they just went from um, Lashley to Gaddis and now they're about to learn a whole new offense. So, um, you know, having a coach that's mindful of that to me, that's how you get the best out of your, offense going into the spring so that for the summertime you can feel confident they can feel confident you know if you have someone that has a very complex playbook or you know is trying to install too much I think there's going to be a lot of young guys and especially a lot of freshmen that you know just learned Gaddis's offense or I think my guys like Tyler that had to learn yeah. you know Lashley's Gaddis and now is trying to understand a whole new one and to me it's not even the plays um, most teams run the same plays. A lot of it's going to be the terminology, you know, like mm -hmm. what do I call, whether it's double flints, do I call it razor? And this guy calls it slay. So I got to speak in his terminology. Most of the time, you know, offensive coordinators don't speak in the terminology of the last OC. They're going to speak in their in kind of what they know. Um, so to me, I think that's going to be a huge um, aspect of it that, you know, a lot of people aren't going to understand when you have, you know, guys that aren't producing the way they want to at practices, because a lot of them are going to be thinking more than just reacting to kind of the play call because they're learning whole new plays. So to me, I think that's going to be a huge aspect of the spring. That makes a lot of sense. You know, this time of year when you're a few few weeks away from spring football, I know guys are, are working out, you know, the actual like physical contact with coaches I'm sure is limited right now, but mm -hmm. like usually this time of year, like if you're a quarterback, uh, how much are you usually like, talking with coaches and if, if you had an offensive coordinator right now which Miami doesn't uh how much communication would usually be taking place you know a few weeks before the spring yeah so usually what happens is um is that for us like we would get a script so like it would be plays but obviously the coaches can't be out there but because you know right. we knew the plays like when I had James Coley you know I had in my freshman even to my sophomore year, he just gave us the plays and everyone kind of knew it because you know we were transitioning from year one to year two um, to me, I think that's an interesting concept because, you know, when the guys after like we stood after our lift, 
we used to run seven on seven. We used to even run like 11 on 11 where like obviously the D linemen wouldn't rush, but the offensive linemen, they would pass set, get a couple run plays. You know, we'd even do like some run plays. Maybe it's a toss, maybe it's, you know, simple inside zone, just kind of guys still moving like football players. Um, to me, without an offensive coordinator, at least for the offensive side, you don't really know what to call. You know what I mean? Especially like I'm thinking about if I'm a, a freshman like Emory Williams or one of the freshman receivers, like we don't even know how to talk in the same language outside of me saying, hey, you got to run a slant. Hey, you got to run a comeback. You know what I mean? Like I can't signal him anything. I can't tell him a concept um, because we're not on the same page. You know what you called your offense last year, me as another quarterback or something like I did probably didn't call that the same play. Um, so to me, I think those are some unique aspects because obviously, you know, those guys are working, those guys are, um, you know, throwing, catching, doing all that kind of stuff. But for me, I think it's a, a very interesting concept or, or really an unfortunate concept for, um, you know, a lot of these younger offensive guys that don't really know, you know, what is the playbook, what is the terminology, which to me is a, is a huge learning curve for any freshman that wants to play. You know, as far as offensive coordinator candidates, uh, I can't emphasize this enough that they're, uh, this search is being held very close to the vest by Mario Cristobal. He's keeping a very tight inner circle on this. We have had a handful of names who have interviewed that have leaked. Um, and one of those who I'm led to believe might be the leader in the clubhouse is Shannon Dawson, the offensive coordinator at Houston. Uh, he comes from an air raid background, mm -hmm. right? He learned from Hal Mummy and has worked uh, under Dana Holgerson at multiple spots. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure that uh, that he and Cristobal probably appreciates the fact that Dawson appreciates the line of scrimmage play. Um, but, you know, interesting because Cristobal is not known for – air raid offense is anywhere he's been so i think it's interesting that he would open his search up this much do you think someone like shannon dawson with an air raid how well do you think that could fit miami's personnel yeah to me personally i love it um big air raid guys so um, i heard mummy so i didn't learn from mummy but i learned from someone that coached with mummy i learned from um oh man he was at la tech uh, i'm i'm gonna oh man tony franklin That's oh yes I learned from. yeah so when I was in high school, um, our high school were in the Tony Franklin system. So it was a lot of air raid. It was a lot of, you know, fine space. You know, one thing that, you know, I think Kansas City does a really good job of is you'll see them run a route and there's no one in the zone and they'll just sit it down. And you see that Patrick Mahomes and the quarterback or Patrick Mahomes and receiver on the same page. Hey, we're going to find grass. You know, we're not going to run ourselves into coverage. Um, you know, I think you're seeing a lot more of that. I know a lot of people talk about tempoing routes, but tempoing routes to me is just finding grass. Hey, there's a guy there. I got to slow my route down. To find it. So to me, if they're running that type of offense, um, I love it. You know, I think that more NFL teams are starting to go more spread, um, you know, and I think even when you hear like Nick Saban mm -hmm. talk, you know, the two things that are really, really killing um, defenses nowadays is one tempo, you know, the air raids, they're moving fast, they're stretching the field out. And then secondly is RPOs, you know, there's linemen that are moving two or three yards down the field and that really messes up a linebacker's key. You know, when the line, when a lineman attacks, I'm supposed to go meet them. Um, so to me, you know, that those are concepts that I hope that, you know, he exposes. Um, one thing that I, that I looked up that I was super interested about is he was actually the offensive coordinator and receivers coach. Um, for me, my favorite team outside of um, the University of Miami. And I'll say it was for one year, but it was the year West Virginia had Tavon Austin and Geno yep. Smith. Um, and I would just say, like, I used to watch their highlights when I was in high school. Like, they were by far the most dynamic duo that I've, I've, I've seen, at least from my eyes um and in college football so to me that was one thing when I saw it I was like oh yeah at least like you know when when West Virginia was good that year they were good based on utilizing what they had you know they had a really good receiver in Tavon Austin they found smart ways to get him the ball in open space and obviously same kind of concept that Miami has athletes we just got to get them the ball in easy catchable situations so that you know after the catch is kind of their job um so to me at least from that concept I think that that's a huge bonus um, I would just say I, I, I hope we tempo. You know, I think whenever you see yeah. teams like Tennessee, um, you know, I even said it, you go back and watch the first drive of Georgia and Georgia tempo TCU. They didn't have to do it, but they knew that tempo was a good way to catch people off guard, to keep people like kind of on, on their toes. Um, and I hope that's something that we don't have to be a tempo team where we're snapping it in, like Tennessee. But I do think, you know, there's some points when you get a first down, you move across the 50 yard line, tempo, have a shot ready, you know, catch these guys on their heels. Um, so to me, I think that if he can incorporate something like that, I think that at least from like the air raid, I, I know he has a good grasp on what he's doing. So I'm excited to see, you know, what he can bring to the table if Miami does hire him.
My friends, we have a lot more to get to here with Malik Rozier, including uh, what it's going to take for Tyler Van Dyke to have a bounce back season in 2023. And I'd, I'd love to get Malik's take on offensive issues last year, how much of it was on Gaddis and how much of it was just on the personnel. Cause I, I think Malik can give us a, a very fair perspective on that. So keep it locked right here to locked on canes and guys, make sure you're taking advantage of LinkedIn jobs. My friends, small business owners, or your hiring manager, you know that success in 2023 really all depends on the team members you surround yourself with. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. With LinkedIn Jobs, you can hire qualified candidates more efficiently by matching open roles with people who have the skills, values, and experiences to help you achieve your goals. Maybe Cristobal is using LinkedIn Jobs to find his next offensive coordinator. LinkedIn Jobs helps you quickly attract qualified candidates to your open jobs with targeting tools. They go beyond resume data by using insights from your job post co company and their 875 million member profiles to put your post in front of the most qualified candidates. These are just some of the reasons why LinkedIn jobs rates, uh, they are rated number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to and faster. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Guys, I have found jobs through LinkedIn jobs before. I know this works. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Thank you so much for making Locked on Canes your first listen today. We're available free wherever you get your podcasts and available free on YouTube. Uh, we always get amazing insight when Malik Rozier joins us, former Miami Hurricanes quarterback. So Malik, uh, you know, you and I had to do some of those painful postgame shows mm -hmm. last year. And uh, there was obviously frustration with Miami's offense, which scored uh, against power five opposition, only 19.4 points per game. How much of that was on the coaching and the play calling from the former OC, Josh Gaddis? And how much of that do you think was on his personnel not being good enough and not executing? Um, I would say it's about 60-40 players being in the wrong on 60 coaches you know, on probably about 40%. Yeah. Um, the only reason why I say that, because at the end of the day, you know, players got to execute the plays, whether it's drop balls, whether it's a bat ball, whether it's, you know, uh, offensive lineman missing a block. Um, I will say that, you know, there were a lot of injuries at the offensive line. I think that if you're going to win in college football, it has to start up front. You know, I think that's one reason why I at least um, give Mario so much slack is because I know that that's his point of emphasis. And I know once you fix – the offensive defensive line, everything else, especially in South Florida with the recruiting and, you know, the amount of athletes that we have, everything else is, is very easy to recruit. Um, so, you know, I, I don't really blame it on Gaddis. I will say that the only thing that I wish he would have added, which I've talked about a lot, is tempo. You know, I think that there were some points where, you know, you saw what worked last year. You saw that, you know, them playing fast, giving Tyler the chances to take shots because – I just felt like last year we didn't take enough shots. And, yes, I get that, you know, we lost a lot of production with Rambo and um, Mike Harley. But at the end of the day, most of those kids out, outside of the grad transfers were in the same offense. You know what I mean? So the fact that we weren't taking the shots, to me, I felt like Gaddis played kind of timid because he was worried about, you know, the kids that were on the field. Maybe he thought, hey, they weren't as good. But whenever you play timid, kids can feel that. You know what I mean? With, when you go from a high-powering, high-tempo, we're going to take shots, you know, like, I'm going to give you guys a chance to make plays to where you have a very controlled, methodical, slow pace, a lot of, like, short passes just to try to get guys open and kind of get people warm. To me, I think that's the kind of personality that your offense takes on. You know what I mean? That's one of the reasons why I love James Coley. High energy, high motor, loves to take shots, and, like, you feed off that. You know what I mean? You want to go to practice you because you know that there's going to be something new, creative, that, like, you have, as, as a quarterback have a chance to make an explosive play. You know, at least when I played, that's what we lived off of. You know, we lived off of chunk plays. We lived off of big posts or a double move or a big run. Um, and I think that's, you know, unfortunately how college football is played nowadays is, you know, it, it takes one play. You know, you think about Tennessee in a blink of an eye, they're hitting a, a goal or a post. It can be first, second, or even third down. And to me, I think that's the kind of identity Miami needs. And I know a lot of fans are, you know, saying, well, oh, it makes the defense tire and the defense plays a lot of plays. And, yeah, I get that. But, you know, that's why you have depth. That's why you make sure guys are in great shape. That's why you make sure guys are hydrated. You know, um, to me, I think that's the side, too, that we got to address that, hey, you know, if we have two or three deep, like, you know, Georgia, Alabama, that you should be able to compete with tempo teams. Because, you know, when Tennessee's out there running plays and they're going 15 to 20 plays and they're running under 10 seconds, 
Alabama still sub and those guys are tired. So when the offense works, even the defense now have to be two or three deep because now their guys are going to get tired if you have, you know, a successful tempo offense. Um, so to me, I think that's some some interesting stuff that, that Gaddis could have done um, is, is really tempo and then maybe throwing the tight ends there more. Um, you know, I think that we had some really good tight ends. I think some cool like 13 personnel getting Jaleo Skinner, Elijah Arroyo and Will Mallory out there, and instead of letting those guys go flat, let them go vertical. Like I would have run four verse with those guys and say, "Hey, if you stick a small corner on Aaliyah or on Elijah Skinner, throw the fade. If they stick it on Will Mallory, throw the fade. If they stick, you know, maybe they stick safety on the outside. Now you got a, you know, a slot guy or like a nickel Sam on, you know, um, Elijah Roy or whatever up the middle now because I'm thinking Skinner and Will on the outside. Now you're throwing a back shoulder on a smaller guy. So to me, you know, using their height. I think that's one thing that Georgia does really well when you see them. There's multiple tight ends. I know they have two freaks with, you know, Brock Vandergriff and um, – not Brock Vandergriff, but with um, – is Darnell and who's, who's, who's the oh, white Why kid? am I blanking as well? Yeah, I know. He's, 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 he's a beast. He's the best tight end in the college football. Bowers. Brock Bowers. Yeah. Right. I know they have them, but, like, you see how they use them. It's, it, it's speed sweeps. It, it's, it's small passes. And then it's, it's shots. You know, I think that's one thing that – um, we didn't do a good enough job was, was getting our tight ends consistently into vertical games. Um, you know, at least when I played, then that's one reason why I'm a big advocate for Coley. Um, you go back when I played a lot of the passes that I threw to our tight ends were vertical shots. It was on linebackers. It was on safeties. And, you know, and look at our tight ends. You had David Njoku, Chris Herndon. Those are really two good tight ends. And I think we have the same thing here with, you know, Elijah Arroyo and obviously Will Mallory and Jaleel Skinner. It's like, take advantage of the Mitch matches. And to me, I think tight end is, is one that at least last year, I didn't think that we took enough advantage of. What's it going to take uh, next year for Tyler Van Dyke? And, and he's, he's all in, um, you know, he had an opportunity to hit the transfer portal, decided not to do that. He's, He's all in with Miami heading into the 2023 season. He's going to have a new coordinator and a new quarterbacks coach. That might be the same person, might be two different people. What's it going to take for Tyler Van Dyke, who was you know a preseason Heisman candidate for a number of different reasons, did not live up to that last year? What's it going to take for TVD to bounce back? Um, I'll say a couple of things. I'll say one, believing in yourself. You know, I I think Jalen Hurts is probably the best testimony to that. You know, at the end of the day, everyone's going to have their opinion of you. Everyone's going to think something, whether it was high, whether it was low. Um, but the only people that really matter is what you think of yourself and the people in that building. You know, I think that's one thing that, that Tyler's understanding. Um, and, and also, you know, when we talked last year, a lot of it, you know, was just him believing in himself. And, and like I said, a lot of it is, you know, terminology. You know, he, he's calling the same thing something differently. But, you know, the way that they were running, they were a little more methodical. They were a little more pre precise on things they did. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think that that kind of got to Tyler. So, like I said, believing in himself, I think a ton of work with these receivers. You know, the more work that he can do with these guys during the all season is, is, is really, really going to help them. And, and lastly, I'll just say voice your opinion. You know, you're a leader on the team. You know, um, at the end of the day, like the offense has to run through you. So you got to feel comfortable. You can't let, you know, somebody dictate your life, your career. At the end of the day, you got to be able to control your destiny. And I think that he's earned enough respect that if he says, Hey man, like, you know, I don't think this is a good play. The offensive coordinator should at least be able to hear him out and they should be able to talk through it. That was one thing that I really, really gave credit to the Ricks was that they understood that I was smart enough that there was at least four or five plays that I told them, Hey coach, you no, know, this is a blitz that they do. If they want to run this blitz on third down, like I'm screwed. There's no protection. Mm -hmm. There's no hot. Like, you know, I don't have a way out of it. It just puts us in a bad play. And yes, you know, they might not run it, but if they do now, now, there, there's no way to protect myself. And, you know, there were plays like that, that the Ricks listen and they can. And I think that's a huge concept that, you know, whenever the guy comes in, Tyler has to spend a lot of time with him. He has to understand, you know, who the guy is, how he thinks, you know, what kind of quarterback he wants and, and really know how Tyler, like how I can play best in his offense. You know, I think that's going to be a huge factor is, is just the communication. Um, and I think that, you know, if he can find him an uh, offensive coordinator slash quarterback coach that, you know, obviously is set in his ways, but at least allows a quarterback to, you know, voice his opinion. Um, and, and, you know, the quarterback coach can make Tyler feel comfortable um, throughout the season. I think that'll be fun. When we come back, I want to get Malik Rozier's take on Miami's defense. They've got a new coordinator, Lance Gidry. Uh, what can he do right that Kevin Steele didn't do right <laughs> last year? And I do want to get Malik's opinion. He already brought up the name on one of the offensive coordinator candidates that Mr. Rozier knows very well. So keep it locked right here to Locked on Canes. Guys, if you're looking for a delicious treat, but you don't want all the fat and calories, 
You've got to try a built bar. We just got through the holidays. Like a lot of you, I've been trying to eat healthier this year and I've been succeeding because you don't want to compromise taste. I've got the right thing for you. You've got to try built with built healthy is actually tasty. Seriously. They're so delicious. You're not going to even think they're good for you, but they are perfect for your new year's resolution. What makes built bars so good? Well, for starters, they're all covered in 100% real chocolate. That's right. Real chocolate. They come in unbelievable flavors like churro, peanut butter, brownie, coconut, almond. My personal favorite mm. are the cookie dough chunk puffs. Cause I'm not sure how built does it, but these bars, they taste like a candy mm. bar while maintaining amazing macros. And what's even better is they're healthy. Only 130 calories only four grams of sugar a whopping 17 grams of protein and now you don't need to wait around to get a box for years we've told you about ordering your built bars at built.com you can still do that of course but now you can also get them at your local walmart or sam's club so if you're close to a walmart or sam's club run in grab a 13 bar box with hit flavors like brownie batter or churro you can thank me later because i love me some built bars Thank you so much for making Locked On Canes your first listen today. Make sure you make Locked On College Basketball with Isaac Shade and Andy Patton your second listen. I think I'm going to be making a cameo on their next episode to talk about Miami UNC tonight. So hopefully Miami wins and I can talk about how happy I am and not about how <laughs> pissed off I am about how the game goes. But I think I'm going to turn up on the next episode of Locked On College Basketball with the guys. So check that out. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. But we're talking football here with Malik Rozier, former Miami Hurricanes quarterback so Malik uh you uh you already mentioned the name James Coley you've worked with him before I know you really like Coley a lot as do I um I my hope is he could end up on Miami's next staff somehow if it's not offensive coordinator I'd love to bring him in as like a wide receivers coach and maybe a co-OC um so what makes James Coley special uh and, and not just the coaching stuff, Malik, because he has a reputation for being just a relentless recruiter. Mm -hmm. um, one, I'll say, you know, it's it's not the fact that he's a relentless recruiter, which I'll say he is. He, he does. He does a great job. It's the connection that he builds with people. You know, it's 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 very mm -hmm. genuine. Um, he I would say that to me, he is definitely the definition of like that South Florida um, kind of like Latin culture community where like, you know, once they see you as family, they embrace you. You know what I mean? And that was one thing that, you know, when I first entered at the University of Miami as a freshman, um, James Coley and his family did a really good job of, you know, having us over for dinners, making me and Brad Kaya feel at home. If I needed anything, whether it was about life, whether it was about sports, I always knew that, you know, James would at least take the time and give me an honest answer. Um, you know, I think that that's a huge part of football that a lot of people don't understand is that, you know, especially to keep kids at a university, I, I can't just like what he says to me. I have to like him as a person. I got to know, you know, whenever this guy cusses me out, whenever, you know, I'm having a bad practice and, you know, he's in my ear and it's hot and it's 97 degrees. And, you know, I, I know back then it was a two a day. Now they don't do two a days. But for me, it was like, it's a two a day. And I got this guy chirping in my ear on my second practice. And, you know, like it's, it's the, far, it's, it's the fact that, like, I know him and I know it's a place out of love. And it's not just because, you know, he's intimidated by the offensive – not offensive at the time, but he's intimidated by the, you know, head coach. Because, like, there have been situations to where, um, you know, uh, OC has been mad at position coach because he's like, nah, the receiver ran the wrong route. And, you know, the receiver – back and be like, coach, you told me to run that route. And then he's getting cussed out by a coach that told him to run that route because the coach is getting cussed out by the OC. You see what I mean? So it's like a chain mm -hmm. reaction of, okay, I'm, I'm doing it right like you told me, but I'm getting cussed out. That was never a reason for Coley. You know what I mean? If Coley cussed you out, it was because you did something wrong. Um, you know, I would say at least for the quarterback, there was times where I got cussed out because offensive lineman did something wrong and I was supposed to correct him on it. Um, but it was a place of like, you know, if we're going to be the best, you got to make sure everyone's on the same page. You got to make sure, you know, that everyone's doing the, the, the same thing. Um, and then I'll say he's creative. You know, he was someone that, at least in the um, offensive firm room, like there was multiple times, you know, we'd watch the 49ers, we'd watch, oh my God, he was a huge Tom Brady fan. So, you know, we'd watch a ton of like play action pass that, you know, Bill Belichick was doing with like Tom Brady at the time. Um, and, and, and that's one thing that I thought was really cool was that, you know, Coley at least had the, um, I would say innovation and at least the purity to understand that, you know, my offense isn't a hundred percent correct. I almost don't be correct, but like, uh, a lot of people think that their offense is, is done. Like, you know, I don't need to add any more plays. I don't need to, like, reinvent the wheel. Like, my offense works. 
Um, but I think that whenever you see how college football has changed, the way that, you know, now you can run two tight ends, three tight ends. You know, sometimes you can run 21 personnel, a lot more effective because guys are more hybrid. You know, when you watch the way that, like, Kansas City did that, that you need, like, they motion the guy and most people go up and they run across and now they did an out. You know, that's a play that I promise you that if Cole is an offensive coordinator, you're going to see that play at least twice next year. Just because he says, hey, like, how do they run it? Why do they run it? He's going to dissect. He's going to take, you know, some of the smartest minds in the NFL and say, hey, how can I incorporate those cool plays that I know, you know, get people open? How can I incorporate that for my offense? And you know, who do I need to put in that spot? You know, is it Xavier Restrepo instead of being a Kadarius Tony? You know, what I mean, right. that's the way that Coley thinks is he's going to find, you know, who's my key player? Who can make the plays? Okay, now, why did they run this play? Who do they want to get open? Okay, now, now how do I put that for my offense? Um, and then I would say that, you know, he was super open with the quarterbacks. You know, he, he allowed us to, hey, guys, I want to incorporate these plays. What do you guys think about it? And now there were some where he was like, nah, like we're running it. You know, this is a great, you know, red zone play. This team plays quarters, like we're going to run it. But there was also plays that, you know, he allowed at least Brad Kaya to voice his opinion and say, hey, coach, like, I, I don't like that play. Like, can we move that to like the fifth, third down call? Like, here's a play that I like better that I'm more comfortable with. You know, I think that's an aspect that really allowed Brad Kaya when he was there to become successful because it didn't matter what play Coley called. It was, it was in Brad's mind, it was still his play because, you know, I chose the list. But it was a list of plays that Coley gave him. But the fact that he gave Brad some input, at least Brad was able to feel comfortable with each play call. Um, you know, I know that's kind of like a psychological effect, but I think that's something that's huge. You know, if you're going to have a really good a really good quarterback, he has to feel comfortable. He has to feel like, you know, every play that you call sets him up for success. Um, and I think that's one thing that Coley at least does really well is that he builds a bond, he builds a connection, and that, like, the guys on the field really want to play for him. You know, I think that's something that – speaks volume you know when you talk to anyone that's been around Coley I don't think there's many people that's like oh I hate that guy like most people like you know I love him he's a great person um, and I think that's something that you want to OC and I think that's something that could really help us in the future I like that a lot and that was explained very very well uh, I wanted to get a take on the defense uh before we wrap it up here because I, I know that uh Kevin Steele's defense could be frustrating last year. Uh, I certainly was more frustrated with the offense than I was with the defense. But uh, so we have a new defensive coordinator, Lance Guidry. Steele is on his way to Alabama. What would you like to see Guidry do that Steele didn't do or anything he can correct from the previous defense? Um, yeah, I, I would say the biggest thing that I would really want to see, and this is just me being biased, is a ton of main coverage. Um, you know, I would turn our secondary into a track team. Um, you guys are going to have to run all day like cat and mouse. And if, if, if I'm him in recruiting, I'm finding the most physical, finding guys that are over six foot. I'm finding guys that can run really, really fast. And lastly, which I think is most important, I'm finding guys that can catch. You know, that was one thing that I really learned at Georgia was that when you're playing a good offense, just because you have a batted ball on first down doesn't mean they're not going to hit you with a 20-yard completion on second down. You know, I think that's one thing that, you know, at least from a recruiting standpoint, I think it has to do a good job of is finding man corner. You know, I, 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 I would just say that the hardest defenses that I've ever played have never been quarters teams, have never been, you know, that Georgia Tech three spot deep because you can route those up based on, um, you know, saying, hey, like, we're going to pull the outside linebacker with a flat and we're going to want to curl behind his head. You know, his job is to get the flat. But when you want to curl, there's no one in that area just because he's been pulled. Um, when it's man coverage, it's mano a mano. It's you versus him. Yes, you know, sometimes people can do picks, and I think there are times whenever you should run zone. Um, but to me, I would just say that, you know, with the way that they're recruiting, um, I'd want to see a ton of man. I know that he does run quarters. Um, I like quarters. I would say that quarters are good. You just you just need really good corners. Um, you know, in quarters, um, once the receiver, especially inside guys like slot guys or tight ends, once they go past 10 to 12, those safeties turn into man. So outside lanes is basically cover zero. So that's where you know, um, at least like if you guys watch a lot of Big Ten football, that's a lot of what they run. They run a lot of quarters, which is why you see a lot of double posts, which is why you see a lot of double moves is because those corners are by themselves. Um, so that to me is where like I'd rather you just run cover one man or even do what Florida State does, run two man. Um, to me, I think quarters are, is, is a form of zone that, you know, just unless you have elite corners, it puts them in binds at some point because it's not even their fault. I mean, you're technically running zero over the top when it looks like they have safety help when they really don't. Well, I always learn something when Malik joins us. Make sure you follow him on Twitter at Malik Rozier 12. Follow at Miami Mills Club as well. And, and what's going on uh, this offseason with the Miami Mills Club? Ah, perfect that you asked, and I appreciate it. So, yeah, um, it's right now it's unofficial. Um, you know, I have, I've worked with compliance. We are actually this week, I'm going to send them back a legal document, and uh, actually, I get all my speakers to um, 
sign it as well. But basically, the last weekend of March and oh, no, my bad, the last Wednesday of March and the first Wednesday of April, um, they're going to give us about an hour to an hour and a half to come in and network with the student athletes, which is huge. Um, you know, depending on how that goes, they're actually going to potentially do a whole partnership in the summer. Um, a lot of reason why we're not doing the partnership right now is around the time when we're going to go in, the NIL laws are going to change. So I don't want to start one contract and have to go through and rewrite it because the NIL laws have either loosened or tightened. Um, so we're going to wait until probably end of May, June to actually do an official partnership. Um, but at least at the end of March and beginning of April, they're giving us two weeks to go in. I'm going to bring business business partners slash speakers to come in and basically educate these kids saying, hey, you know, this is how real estate works now. This is how, you know, how you can start your own company and really helping them, you know, meet people that, you know, whether they play a snap or they don't, you know, when they graduate because of the hard work that they put in, they want to help these guys find internships. You know, they want to help them build their own business. They want to help them become, you know, self-operating. Um, and I think that's big. You know, I think school teaches you how to become an employee. And I think mm. that, you know, if you're if you're smart enough, you know that. And it's so about teaching these kids how to self-operate. I feel like a lot of people, especially in football, you know, for the next four to five years, these kids are going to have down to the minute where they're supposed to be at, what time it ends, what time they have to transfer. Like, that's how life is for them. And then when you graduate, life isn't like that. You set your own schedule. You do everything by yourself. You know, a lot of things nowadays are automated, especially with A.I., so it's like teaching these kids, you know, yeah, the book helps you. But in a day, you know, we're going to bring guys that are making, you know, millions of dollars currently in the industry that you want to go into. So we're at least going to have them network with them. We're going to have them at least help them out with different areas of um, career paths that, you know, kids can want to go into. Um, and we even officially figured out a way to, you know, once the kids graduate to uh, give them a ten thousand dollar business grant. So that, you know, once so, yeah, they're going to actually submit to us um, some form of like, hey, this is what I'm working on. And then, you know, we'll be able to say, hey, you know, you graduated, you have no ties to university. So, like, we love your business idea. Here's $10,000 for you to go through and invest because, you know, we never want. Uh, it's almost like Ma Malik Shark Tank right there. It's pretty neat. Yeah, it, it, it is a version. You know, I, yeah. I just believe that student athletes work the hardest. I just also believe that, you know, student athletes are they spend their entire, I would say, from the time they're four or five years old, which are most of us started all the way into your 24, your main focus is football. Yeah. You learn in school yeah. to pass good grades so that you can be on the field. But like until football's taken away from you, you never spend a hundred percent time, effort, energy into like a business. Um, and that's where, you know, we don't want to say, Hey, you know, you didn't make enough money through NIL or, you know, you didn't make it to the league. So we know that you don't have capital to start a great business idea. You know, if you take the time, effort and energy, like I have people that I've met with that, you know, money isn't their issue. It's finding, you know, good people to invest time into to help, you know, build up the next generation. So that's where I said, hey, like, what if I can get, you know, Miami graduates that, you know, we have helped educate that in, in like business specific areas that, you know, um, want to come to you with a great business idea. And they're like, I would love that. So that's kind of what we have made um, is, is, is a way for one for us to feel good enough saying, hey, you know, we at least educate these kids. So whenever they turn the business idea, it's not like we didn't help them in any way, shape, form or fashion. Um, so it's, 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 it's two part. But, you know, I'm super excited about the opportunity. And I think that, you know, it was something that I would have definitely taken advantage of. So I hope a lot of the students take advantage of it as well. No doubt. That's great work uh, being done there. So huge shout out to Malik. Huge thank you to everyone who took time to listen and to watch today. We'll talk to you again next time on another episode of Locked on Canes, part of the awesome Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day.